So you clicked on this video. That's interesting. But thank you anyway for clicking it. Thank you for being here. Do I know what is about to happen? A little bit, but I'll try to explain it to you before the fall. Like the season and also, you know, the reckoning. I stole that. I stole that from a TikTok. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Like I fully regurgitated that. So my name is Noah. I recently saw Red, White and Royal Blue which for some reason just doesn't compute in my head as a title. I keep wanting to say red, white, and yellow, blue. So I watched the movie. If you guys haven't seen my reaction to that, it'll be somewhere here in a card in the descriptive boppity boop. The movie kind of got me interested in the book because I really enjoyed the dialogue and how certain stories really, like wrapped up really prettily in certain places. And I decided that because of that, of those aspects I enjoyed about the movie, I started becoming interested in trying to read the book. So now that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be reading the book. Here are the things, right, that you should find out. A little bit about me. I haven't read like a, a published book. It's very important to make that distinction because I have been reading stories and literature, just not published work. I haven't read a published book in quite a while. It's been tough. My attention stan, my attention stan. It is dwindling. So I'm thinking like one of the ways in which I could get back into reading is doing this video where I will read, where I will read the book out loud and react to it. It sounds ridiculous and insane. And also like, what? How long is this video then? Truly, I don't know. So I thought, hey, you know what? There are no rules here. Nothing is sacred. I will try to read this book in front of other people. I will record it and then monetize it. And so that's what you're watching right now. Thanks, by the way. Thank you again for clicking onto this. Read chapter one for this first video because I'm not really sure, because I haven't edited it yet. I don't know what this video is gonna look like. I don't know if it's gonna be entertaining or something that I'm going to move forward with. So I thought I would try it out first with the first chapter and then just see what I come up with, what your guys' reaction to it is. And like, if it's something <laughs> that's worth like doing more of and also expanding into other books maybe. I really don't know. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm filming this still. So I don't really understand what editor Noah is going to come up with, but I'm trusting her and I'm trusting you guys to trust her and to trust me also. So just to be clear, this doesn't mean that I'm going to be reading the entire first chapter. Okay. Like this isn't an audio book. <laughs> this is me highlighting certain aspects that maybe I enjoy or have a reaction to. If you have seen any of my videos in the past, it's going to be kind of in the same format, I think, of like how I do my reaction videos to shows and watchable media, but I'm just going to turn it into like me reading and then commenting on it. I know this sounds so strange. So, uh, you know, this could also be one of those videos that you could put in the background as you try to accomplish other things because you are actually trying to be a functional human and part of society. And I'm over here reading out loud for you. I'm cheering you on. I'm a part of this. Let me be a part of this. Please expect that if this is something that will continue, I will most definitely be reading this book in a pace that is only comparable to two snails fucking. Slowly. So yeah, let's go. Oosh. Okay. Okay. Ah! I have to assume the position, the bisexual position. And it's this. I'm trying to get comfortable, right? Which just means like stretching my back. On the White House roof, tucked into a corner of the promenade. Promenade? <laughs> Shit. I should, you know what? Before reading this, I should have first made sure that I could read. Rule number one, don't get caught. The east and west bedrooms on the second floor are generally reserved for the first family. They were first designated as one giant state bedroom for visits for the Marquis de Lafayette. <laughs> Alex has the east across from the treaty room and June uses the west next to the elevator. June, I figured when I first read this, is the character that they cut out in the movie. So Alex's little sister. I still haven't read the entirety of the book. Um, and by that, I mean like I've only read like up until page 10 or something. So I was saving it for this 
I was saving it for this video. Just chill. Growing up in Texas, their rooms were arranged in the same configuration on either side of the hallway. Back then, you could tell June's ambition of the month. At 12, it was watercolor paintings. At 15, lunar calendars and charts of crystals. At 16, clippings from the Atlantic, a UT Austin pennant, Gloria Steinem, Zora Neale Hurston, and ex excerpts from the papers of Dolores Huerta. This is like kind of fun, funky, fresh. And this is something that they did in the movie too, where there's just like this immediate introduction of how pulled out of the small pond kind of fish the Claremont Diaz family is. Did that make sense? Uma Thurman, let me say that again. They were living a regular, normal suburban life probably, and then suddenly the next house that they moved to is the White House. That is crazy. I like how the comparison is like, this is also what our old house used to look like. So it's almost as if like, Alex doesn't even really feel at home in the White House yet because he's still, you know, home base is still somewhere else in Texas. But maybe a uh, home, and the very definition of it will change for Alex um, a few pages down the line, maybe? We'll see. His own room was forever the same, just steadily more stuffed with lacrosse trophies and piles of AP coursework. I thought he didn't play lacrosse. Wait, was lacrosse the... Wait, no. is that the one with the horse? Or is lacrosse the one with the water? I don't know things. I'm not in the sports fandom. <laughs> it's all gathering dust in the house they still keep back home. On a chain around his neck, always hidden from view, he's worn the key to that house since the day he left for DC. So the key is consistent between the book and the Mevet. His own room was once Caroline Kennedy's nursery, and later, warranting some sage burning from June, Nancy Regan's office. The painted over Sasha Obama's pink walls with a deep blue. I love that, a sense of a timeline. So this is after the Obamas, after the first black president, new history made with the first female president. Actually, there's no mention of Uma Thurman <laughs> or Alex's mom as the first ever female president, but I'd like to assume just because it's like right after Obama. June came that fall, fresh out of UT. She's never said it, but Alex knows she moved in to keep an eye on him. Wait, fresh out of UT? So she's older? She knows better than anyone else how much he gets off on being this close to the action, and she's bodily yanked him out of the West Wing on more than one occasion. He's not going to be the youngest elected congressman in modern history without earning it, but nobody needs to know how hard he's kicking underwater. His sex symbol stock would plummet. <laughs> would it though? Is that shit? I mean, I don't know about that. Case in point, Hasanabi, still a sex symbol. <laughs> You just need to watch more streamers, Alex. <laughs> you clearly have the time. Hey, says a voice at the door, and he looks up from his laptop to see June edging into his room. Edging? Two iPhones and a stack of magazines tucked under one arm and a plate in her hand. She brings, she brings food, she brings offerings. I like her already. I'm so sad that she wasn't in the movie. What'd you steal today? Alex asks, pushing the pile of papers on his bed out of her way. Assorted donuts, June says as she climbs up. She's wearing a pencil skirt with pointy pink flats, and he can already see next week's fashion columns. A picture of her outfit today, a lead-in for some spawn con about flats for the professional gal on the go. What is a spawn con? Is that like sponsored con? <laughs> She's dumped her stack of magazines out on the bedspread and is already busying herself with them. In touch says, I'm dating a French model. Are you? I wish. Same. Ooh, and they're saying you got your asshole bleach. Wait, what? <laughs> asshole bleaching and then with june it's like oh she's maybe like ha, 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 dating a frenchman her brother bleached his asshole so you know we pay equal amounts of attention to both of the first children that one is true alex says through a mouthful of chocolate with sprinkles okay following their tabloid coverage is something of an idle hobby of hers one that in turn amuses and annoys their mother uma thurman given the choice he'd rather read one of the hundreds of glowing pieces of fan fiction about him on the internet alex says her that you had some kind of tryst with a mystery brunette June reads, though the first daughter was whisked off by limousine to a star-studded party shortly after the gala, 21-year-old heartthrob Alex was snapped sneaking into the W Hotel to meet a mystery brunette in the presidential suite and leaving around 4 a.m. Sources inside the hotel reported hearing amorous noises from the room all night and rumors are swirling the brunette was none other than 
Nora Holleran, the 22-year-old granddaughter of Vice President Mike Holleran and third member of the White House trio. Could it be the two are rekindling their romance? So they had a history in the book, Nora and Alex, because in the movie, it seemed that they were just purely platonic. And also, I wasn't really sure who Nora was. I'm not I'm not all too clear as well if that was made clear in the movie and I was just distracted by all of the other things that were in the movie. It's not his fault the press won't let it go, though, that they love the idea of them together as if they're modern-day Kennedys. So if he and Nora occasionally get drunk in hotel rooms together watching The West Wing <laughs> and making loud moaning noises at the wall for the benefit of nosy tabloids, he can't be blamed, really. They're simply turning an undesirable situation into their own personal entertainment. Scamming his sister is also a perk. They're watching the West Wing while getting drunk. Nora and Alex living in this life. That's kind of, that's wild. That's pretty unhinged. That's kind of like watching Red Eye on a plane, which I have done. What are you wearing, by the way? For what? The wedding. Whose wedding? Uh, the royal wedding, June says. Of England, it's literally on every cover I just showed you. She holds Us Weekly up again, and this time Alex notices the main story in giant letters. Prince Philip says, I do, said a British accent, along with a photograph of an extremely nondescript British heir and his equally nondescript blonde fiance smiling blandly. A bland smile. I, I have like an idea of what it looks like. I don't know if I can do it in real life. He drops his donut in a show of devastation. <laughs> That's this weekend? Alex, we leave in the morning, June tells him. We've got two appearances before we even go to the ceremony. I can't believe Zara hasn't climbed up your ass about this already. I know I had that written down. I got sidetracked. What, by conspiring with my best friend against me in the tabloids for $50? No, with my research paper, smartass, Alex says, gesturing dramatically at his pile of notes. Is it possible you willfully forgot about the biggest international event of the year because you don't want to see your arch nemesis? June, I'm the son of the President of the United States. Prince Henry is a figurehead of the British Empire. You can't just call him my arch nemesis, Alex says. He chews thoughtfully and adds, arch nemesis implies he's actually a rival to me on any level and not, you know, a stuck up product of inbreeding who probably jerks off to photos of himself. <laughs> Well, you don't have to like him. You just have to put on a happy face and not cause an international incident at his brother's wedding. Yeah, of course, so easily done. I don't understand why anyone would miss mess miss that up. Bug, when do I never? Oh, he oh he calls her Bug like June Bug. Oh, when do I ever not put on a happy face? Alex says. I'm still not sure about my dress. June says. She leans over and steals his laptop away from him, ignoring his noise of protest. Do you think the maroon or the one with the lace? Lace, obviously. It's England. And why, <laughs> what? And why are you trying to make me fail this class, he says, reaching for his laptop only to have his hand swatted away. Go curate your Instagram or something. You're the worst. Shut up. I'm trying to pick something to watch. Ew. You have Garden State on your watch list? <laughs> Shout out Zach Braff, Natalie Portman. It was a fun time. Outside his the wind steers up over the lawn, rustling the linden trees down in the garden. The record on the turntable in the corner has spun out into fuzzy silence. He rolls off the bed and flips it, resetting the needle, and the second side picks up on London, luck, and love. When the universe is picking on you? Fifteen years ago, when his mother first ran for the house, the Austin newspaper gave her a nickname, the Lometa Longshot. Is it Lomita? Hey, Lomita, hey. She'd escaped her tiny hometown in the shadow of Fort Hood. Fort Hood. Pulled night shifts at diners to put herself through law school and was arguing discrimination cases before the Supreme Court by 30. She is such a badass. What a wonderful world we live in. If someone that deserving actually becomes president. That's crazy. She was the last thing anybody expected to rise up out of Texas in the midst of the Iraq war. A strawberry blonde whip smart Democrat with high heels, an unapologetic drawl, and a little biracial family. I love that. Biracial, bilingual, bisexual. Amy, his mother's favorite secret service agent, a former Navy SEAL who is rumored around DC to have killed several men, sits across the aisle. She's got a bulletproof titanium case of crafting supplies open on the couch next to her and is serenely embroidering flowers onto a napkin. Alex has seen her stab someone in the kneecap with a very similar embroidery needle. 
She's single? <clears throat> what? I want to be prepared for my first ever royal wedding. You went to prom, didn't you? Alex says. Just picture that, only in hell. And you, <laughs> and you have to be really nice about it. Can you believe that they spent $75,000 just on the cake? That's depressing. And apparently Prince Henry is going sans date to the wedding and everyone is freaking out about it. It says he was. She affects a comical English accent. <clears throat> Rumored to be dating a Belgian heiress last month. But now, followers of the prince's dating life aren't sure what to think. June is just like on the pulse. Like finger on the pulse, ready to kick ass and look great and lace. And I'm just like all about that vibe. Alex snorts. <clears throat> It's insane to him that there are legions of people who follow the intensely dull dating lives of the royal siblings. He understands why people care where he puts his own tongue. At least he has personality. <laughs> Maybe the female population of Europe finally realized he's as compelling as a wet ball of yarn. Jesus, Alex. You gonna ask him to dance then? The thought makes him want to gag. Yeah, gag all over his d in his dreams. Aw, Nora says, you're blushing. Listen, royal weddings are trash. The princes that have royal weddings are trash. The imperialism that allows princes to exist at all is trash. It's trash turtles all the way down. Oh my God, I remember that book by John Green. You do realize America is a genocidal empire too, right? Yes, June, but at least we have the decency not to keep a monarchy around, Alex says, throwing a pistachio at her. There are a few things about Alex and June that new White House hires are briefed on before they start. June's peanut allergy, Alex's frequent middle of the night request for coffee, June's college boyfriend who broke up with her when he moved to California but is still the only person whose letters come to her directly, Alex's long-standing grudge against the youngest prince. Wow. Alex's grudge against the prince. June is allergic to peanuts. I love that. It's not a grudge, really. It's not even a rivalry. It's a prickling, unsettling annoyance. It makes his palms sweat. <laughs> oh my god, I just realized that like I'm gonna get the full effect of the enemies to lovers in this book, and I'm oh my god, I am so that is the assignment that I want to understand. Andale, andale, mommy, yeah, yeah. Why wasn't that Alex's childhood song? Did it really have to be to the windows, to the walls, to the sweat drip down my <coughs> The tabloids, the world, decided to cast Alex as the American equivalent of Prince Henry from day one, since the White House trio is the closest thing America has to royalty. It has never seemed fair. Alex's image is all charisma and genius and smirking wit, thoughtful interviews, and the cover of GQ at 18. Henry's is placid smiles. <laughs> and gentle chivalry and generic charity appearances. A perfectly blank Prince Charming canvas. Henry's role, Alex thinks, is much easier to play. These are his thoughts. He's allowed to think what he thinks and I shouldn't be mad. It's just like we're getting the insider scoop. I get it. You're charming and witty and you like to spread that around and you do it well. It's also like, what does Henry do really? All right, MIT, he says, what are the numbers on this one? Nora grins. Hmm. She pretends to think hard about it. Risk assessment, F-S-O-T-U-S. Eh? Failing to check himself before he wrecks himself will result in greater than 500 civilian casualties. 98% probability of Prince Henry looking like a total dreamboat. 78% probability of Alex getting himself banned from the United Kingdom forever. Uh, those are th those are trusted stats. Those are better odds than I expected, June observes. Alex laughs, and the plane soars on. <laughs> London is an absolute spectacle. Crowds crowding the streets outside Buckingham Palace and all through the city, draped in Union Jacks and waving tiny flags over their heads. Prince Philip and his bride's face plastered on everything from chocolate bars to underwear. Alex almost can't believe this many people care so passionately about someone so comprehensively dull. You think he's boring? We get it. Oh my god. How many times is he going to call like Henry? The, um, the adjectives that he's using right now, he will eat his words. And the words that he will be eating, dull, bland, placid, inbreeding. <laughs> the ceremony itself seems to last forever, but it's at least sort of nice in a way. It's not that Alex isn't into love or can't appreciate marriage. It's just that Martha is a perfectly respectable daughter of nobility and Philip is a prince. It's as sexy as a business transaction. There's no passion, no drama. Alex's kind of love story is much more Shakespearean. 
What's so Shakespearean about fucking in the stable? <laughs> it feels like years before he settled at a table between June and Nora inside of Buckingham Palace ballroom, and he's irritated enough to be a little reckless. Nora passes him a flute of champagne and he takes it gladly. I mean, same. Cheers. Let's go. Do either of y'all know what a Viscount is? June is saying, halfway through a cucumber sandwich. I think it's that thing... When a vampire creates an army of crazed sex waves and starts his own ruling body, he says. That sounds right, Nora says. <laughs> I wish I were a Viscount, June says. I could have my sex waves deal with my emails. <laughs> Are sex waves good with professional correspondence? Alex asks. I think it could be an interesting approach. Their emails would be all tragic and wanton. She tries in a breathless, husky voice. Oh, damn. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let's. Uh, this is gonna suck, but let's try. Okay, now we. Okay, now we try. <clears throat> <laughs> Alex is opening his mouth to retort when a royal attendant materializes at their table like a dense and dour looking ghost in a bad hairpiece. Let's go! Miss Claremont Diaz, says the man, who looks like his name is probably Reginald or Bartholomew or something. He bows. And miraculously, his hairpiece doesn't fall off into June's plate. His Royal Highness, Prince Henry, wonders if you would do him the honor of accompanying him for a dance. June's mouth freezes halfway, caught in a soft vowel sound, and Nora breaks out into a shit-eating grin. Oh, she'd love to, I am Nora. She's been hoping he'd ask all evening. I June starts and stops, her mouth smiling, even as her eyes slice at Nora. Of course. That would be lovely. Excellent, Reginald Bartholomew says, and he turns and gestures over his shoulder. And there Henry is. <laughs> okay, hold on, I need to... <laughs> Alex, are you okay? You okay, dude? Cause I'm not. And there Henry is, in the flesh, as classically handsome as ever in his tailored three-piece suit, all tuzzled sandy hair and high cheekbones in a soft, friendly mouth. Do I have a friendly mouth? <laughs> he holds himself with innately impeccable posture as if he emerged fully formed and upright out of some beautiful Buckingham Palace posy garden. His eyes lock on Alex's, and something like annoyance or adrenaline spikes in Alex's chest. It's adrenaline. It's adrenaline, but it's going opposite way of your chest. He hasn't had a conversation with Henry in probably a year. His face is still infuriatingly symmetrical. <laughs> Henry deigns to give him a perfunctory nod, as if he's any other random guest, not the person he beat to a Vogue editorial debut in their teens. Alex blinks, seethes, and watches Henry angle his stupid chiseled jaw toward June. <laughs> Everything about this screams, I wanna fuck this guy. Like, I am jealous of him and I wanna fuck him. I also am maybe into him and I wanna fuck him. Angrily describing the way that your rival looks like, saying that they're a piece of nothing while at the same time calling their jaw chiseled, calling their face symmetrical, sandy, tussled hair, like, come on, you were so whipped, bro. Hello, June, Henry says. And he extends a gentlemanly hand to June, who is now blushing. Nora pretends to swoon. <laughs> and she takes his hand cautiously, like she thinks he might be pranking her, which Alex thinks is way too generous to Henry's sense of humor. <laughs> Henry leads her off to the crowd of twirling nobles. So, uh, is that what's happening now? Has he decided to finally shut me up by wooing my sister? Oh, little buddy, Nora says. That's so condescending. <laughs> I'm in love with her. She reaches over and pats his hand. It's cute how you think everything is about you. And true, like how narcissistic can you be? And the answer that Alex has for that is yes. He glances up into the crowd where June is being rotated around the floor by Henry. She's got a neutral, polite smile on her face and he keeps looking over her shoulder, which is even more annoying. June is amazing. The least Henry could do is pay attention to her. He is paying attention to part of her. Her brother. Oh, there it is. What is? 
A royal photographer has swooped in and is snapping a shot of them dancing. Yep, it is for the publicity. And you know what? It kind of works. Alex flags down a waiter and decides to spend the rest of the reception getting systematically drunk. Alex has never told, will never tell, anyone, but he saw Henry for the first time when he was 12 years old. He only ever reflects upon it when he's drunk. He's sure he saw his face in the news before then, but that was the first time he really saw him. June had turned 15 and used part of her birthday money to buy an issue of a blindingly colorful teen magazine. In the center of the magazine were miniature posters you could rip out and stick up in your locker. If you were careful and pried up the staples with your fingernails, you could get them out <laughs> without tearing them. One of them, right in the middle, was the picture of a boy. He had thick, tawny hair and big blue eyes, a warm smile, and a cricket bat over one shoulder. On the bottom corner of the page in pink and blue letters, Prince Henry. Um, okay, where are we going with this flashback? And, um... Do I need to cover my eyes and ears? Alex still didn't really know what kept drawing him back only that he would sneak into June's room and find the page and touch his fingertips to the boy's hair as if he could somehow feel its texture if he imagined it hard enough. The more his parents climbed the political ranks, the more he started to reckon with the fact that soon, the world would know who he was. Then, sometimes, he'd think of the picture and try to harness Prince Henry's easy confidence he also thought about prying up the staples with his fingers and taking the picture out and keeping it in his room, but he never did. His fingernails were too stubby. They weren't made for it like June's, like a girl's. Okay. But then came the first time he met Henry, the first cool detached words Henry said to him. And Alex guessed he had it all wrong, that the pretty flung open boy from the picture wasn't real. The real Henry is beautiful, distant, boring, and closed. This person the tabloids keep comparing him to, who he compares himself to, thinks he's better than Alex and everyone like him. Alex can't believe he ever wanted to be anything like him. Did I miss something? What happened? Wait, what was, what was the first words? They're not in here. And he catches sight of a lone figure hovering near the cake and champagne fountain. It's Prince Henry, yet again, glass in hand, watching Prince Philip and his bride spinning on the ballroom floor. And Alex can't resist the urge to call his bluff. Okay, <clears throat> interaction coming in. He picks his way through the crowd, grabbing a glass of wine off a passing tray and downing half of it. We saw that in the movie. And I pretty much like when I think Alex Claremont Diaz, I think, oh, there he is, just drinking every glass of alcohol in sight. And I love that for him. When you have one of these, Alex says, sidling up to him, you should do two champagne fountains instead of one. Really embarrassing to be at a wedding <laughs> with only one champagne fountain. Alex, Henry says in that maddeningly posh accent. Alex, Alex, Alex. Up close, the waistcoat under his suit jacket is a lush gold and has about a million buttons on it. It's horrible. I um, think that you don't think that it's horrible because it looks horrible. I think you think it's horrible because there are too many buttons to cut through before you can address uh, him, but whatever. Looks like it's your lucky day, Alex says, smiling. Truly a momentous occasion, Henry agrees. His own smile is bright white and immaculate, made to be printed on money. Damn. The most annoying thing of all, is Alex knows Henry hates him too. He must. They're naturally mutual antagonists, but he refuses to outright act like it. Alex is intimately aware politics involves a lot of making nice with people you loathe, but he wishes that once, just once, Henry would act like an actual human and not some polished little wind-up toy sold in a palace gift shop. Do you ever get tired, Alex says, of pretending you're above all this? Henry turns and stares at him. <laughs> I'm sure I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're out here getting the photographers to chase you, swanning around like you hate the attention, which you clearly don't since you're dancing with my sister of all people, Alex says. You act like you're too important to be anywhere, ever. I mean, doesn't that get exhausting? I'm a bit more complicated than that, Henry attempts. Ha! Oh, Henry says, narrowing his eyes. 
you're drunk. I'm just saying, Alex says, resting an overly friendly elbow on Henry's shoulder, which isn't as easy as he'd like it to be since Henry has about four infuriating inches of height on him, so he is taller than Alex on the book. Henry laughs ruefully. Ha ha ho ha 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 ho. I believe perhaps you should consider switching to water, Alex. Damn. Like, even I would be infuriated by that. Not gonna lie to you, but at the same... Because not only is Henry right, but also I hate him. So, you know, generally, that would really rub me the wrong way. Not in the way that I would like to be rubbed. Sorry, I'm not obsessed with you like everyone else. I know that must be confusing to you. Do you know what, Henry says. I think you are. Alex's mouth drops open while the corner of Henry's turns smug and almost a little mean. Have you ever noticed? I have never once approached you and have been exhaustively civil every time we've spoken. Yet here you are, seeking me out again. He takes a sip of his champagne. Simply an observation. What? I am not Alex Stammers. You're the have a lovely evening, Alex, Henry says tersely and turns to walk off. It drives Alex nuts that Henry thinks he gets to have the last word. And without thinking, he reaches out and pulls Henry's shoulder back. And then Henry turns suddenly and almost does push Alex off him this time. And for a brief spark of a moment, Alex is impressed at the glint in his eyes, the abrupt burst of an actual personality. <laughs> The next thing he knows, he's tripping over his own foot and stumbling backwards into the table nearest him. He notices too late that the table is, to his horror, the one bearing the massive eight-tier wedding cake, and he grabs for Henry's arm to catch himself, but all this does is throw both of them off balance and send them crashing together into the cake stand. Cake on two cakes? Especially for a royal wedding. They're pretty overcaked, pretty caked up. He watches as if in slow motion, and it was in the movie, as the cake leans, teeters, shudders, and finally tips. There's absolutely nothing he can do to stop it. It comes crashing down onto the floor in an avalanche of white buttercream, some kind of sugary 75,000 nightmare. I don't know why I think this, but for some reason, I just feel like $75,000 and it's mostly buttercream, y'all got scammed. The room goes heart-stoppingly silent. Heart stop as momentum carries him and Henry through the fall and down, down onto the wreckage of the cake on the ornate carpet. Henry's sleeve still clutched in Alex's fist. Henry's glass of champagne has spilled all over both of them and shattered, and out of the corner of his eye, Alex can see a cut across the top of Henry's cheekbone beginning to bleed. That's... He nearly blinded him, like, that's pretty close to the eye. I'm surprised he isn't freaking out more about this. For a second, all he can think as he stares up at the ceiling while covered in frosting and champagne is that at least Henry's dance with June won't be the biggest story to come out of the royal wedding. His next thought is that his mother is going to murder him in cold blood. Beside him, he hears Henry mutter slowly, Oh my fucking Christ. He registers dimly that it's the first time he's ever heard the prince swear before the flash from someone's camera goes off. I think I should stop here. I'm not really sure what this video is just yet. I think I should stop at just like chapter one and then just kind of see what I can make in the edit. Genuinely, I just decided to do this. Not really sure what kind of video would come out of it. Not sure where this is gonna take me. Does this mean I'm gonna do like a chapter by chapter? Is this a book reaction? Are book reactions a thing? I did no research going into this video, so it probably is and I just have no idea. I enjoyed doing this. I'm not really sure what I'm gonna come up with in the edit. All I know is that like I'm recording on like three different devices right now. First impressions right now, just from the first chapter, I am already a little bit more than in love with the dynamic that's being created between the two characters. I also really enjoy the added uh, factor of the White House trio, which is like Nora, June, and Alex. Like having that in the periphery somehow is just kind of, I don't know, it's exciting, it's fun. I'm interested in like seeing more of the friends together because they're just, they're lovely. Other than that, I'm excited to see all of the other differences between the movie and the book. I had a hunch when I saw the movie, because that's the one that I saw first, that I would maybe 
probably like the book more just because I enjoyed the writing of in the movie. I also enjoyed like the dialogue. I enjoyed the chemistry between the two actors. Like the dialogue so far has been kind of fire, kind of fun. I can't wait to get to the part with the letters. Pretty sure that's gonna kill me. I also do not know what I'm gonna be doing about the love scenes. I think I'm allowed to read them. I don't know. I'll be reading bits and pieces here and there. Again, not sure what this video is gonna be looking like by the time I'm done, but that's what I got for you so far. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, hope whatever you were doing as you kept me in the background of your life, you accomplished, or at least you feel happy about it, or at least you finish a little bit of it, or at least that you got a good lunch during the time that you procrastinated doing what you needed to do. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna say goodbye. Again, thank you so much for watching all the way up to here. Thank you for clicking on my video and for sticking around with me. I appreciate it very mucho. And until the next time, um, I made this and it's delicious. It's a little like layered um, sunflower crackers and there's like strawberry filling between the crackers and then I put cream on top of all the crackers and the biscuits and then I put like peach halves on top of that and this thing is so bomb bro let me give you some peaches the cream the strawberry the crunch with the crackers but it's like softened by the cream should I just be like a food critic probably say ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, open up open up open up oh. Close your eyes. <laughs>